Welcome to Twickenham. Glad you're here this morning. If you are a guest, thanks for coming out to be with us today. Uh, you, uh, if you're traveling, uh, our prayers go with you for uh, safe travels. And if you are from town and looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members. There's a card on the back of the seat in front of you. You can fill that out. Add any prayer requests, updates to your contact information for our uh, files, and then you put that in the collection plate when it passes a little bit later in the service. Hey, question, just a show of hands, how many of you are traveling to see the 100% totality tomorrow? Just curious. Okay, I, I kind of figured that. This is Nerdtown USA. <laughs> how many of you are going to get Eclipse face paint tomorrow? Just <laughs> curious. We're, we're going to have a clown here at the office to paint faces. Make that happen. Yes. We're, we're really not. But here's what we are going to do. We are going to praise the Lord today. Why don't you go ahead and stand? Let me read a scripture to you real quick from Psalms. And it kind of goes, the heavens proclaim his righteousness and all peoples see his glory. That's what we're here to sing about today. Let's praise the Lord. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive.
loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Do to others as you would have them do to you. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. I tell you, Whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Would you be seated as we take our offering? Praise unbroken, praise unending, be yours, be yours forevermore. Praise untainted, praise unfailing, Surrender my devotion. 
sound of good news and the love of the King. How beautiful the hands that serve the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth. How beautiful. How beautiful. As we um, take this time for communion and reflection, I offer these words for you to consider during your time of meditation. This is from 1 John chapter 3. We know what real love is from Christ's example in dying for us, and so we also ought to lay down our lives for our Christian brothers. But if someone who is supposed to be a Christian has money enough to live well and sees a brother in need and won't help him, how can God's love be within him? Let us stop just saying we love people. Let us really love them by showing it in our actions. Will you pray with me? Dear Father, we praise your name. We are so thankful for the example we do have of Jesus' life, the way he interacted, the way he loved, the way he touched. May we have the mind of Christ, may we have the love of Christ as we go out and interact and love and touch. May we truly be lights for his love and lights for your love. As we encounter people, Lord, may we bring hope to them. May we bring peace. May we bring joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I come to you to share this love as he told me to. He said, free.
Will you pray with me? Following the example of, of the love Jesus showed for us, Lord, may we have the same heart to sacrifice, to put your will first. Lord, we just ask that uh, you give us strength, you give us endurance. Often it is very difficult to show love and to do so over a long period of time, and we need strength for that. But most of all, Father, we just need a heart of compassion. We need a heart of service. And so build us up in that way. Teach us to be those kinds of servants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. is Maggie Merriman. Maggie's been a member at Twickenham for a good long while now. Uh, a lot of you folks may remember her husband, Doc, who passed away some years ago. Here you go, that's for you. And uh, a lot of you guys know about a ministry called His Way, which is a, a, a Christ-focused program in Huntsville designed to help men who are struggling with substance addictions and abuse to get through that in the power of Jesus and to go on to be 
clean and sober and walking as men of God. Well, there is a new ministry that is about to take flight in Huntsville that is like his way, except it's for women, and it's called Her Voice in the Rocket City. And Maggie is uh, on the board. Sandra Law, who's one of our members here, is the director of that ministry, the founder of it. Maggie is on the board with several other folks. And Maggie, wanted to have you up here because you, there's a particular reason why this is an important issue for you, something really personal. Can you tell us about that? Yes, and I know that most everybody here uh, knows that my daughter died a year ago in March in 2016. What you probably don't know is there were precipitating factors in her death, and it pointed back to the probable consumption of alcohol and prescription drugs. So this is dear to my heart, that we can teach other women, and as we sang the song that we sang this morning, uh, that is, that's what we need to be doing, and that's what this is all about. After Cynthia's death, Sandra came to me. She was a childhood friend of Cynthia's, and to Mark and I. Mark is Cynthia's husband, but she came to us, and she said that she would like to start a faith-based ministry for women who are bound up in addiction. And of course, most of you know Sandra's story, too, that alcohol put her into a coma and uh, didn't know whether she was going to live or not. But God has refreshed her life, and she is the director of this program. So Mark and I were receptive to this. Mark was Cynthia's husband, and they had triplets, right? Right. But when Cynthia passed right. away, so these girls lost their mom and you lost a daughter. Right. So. Y'all have probably seen those three little blonde girls yeah. here at church yeah. with me. Um, I believe it was in May uh, of 2016 that Sandra went to Tom Reynolds, who is the director or one of the major persons there at his way, sharing her passion and her calling for this. Um, when Sandra went to see him, he told her there are a lot of women out there that, are, uh, that have this same passion. And it was like he was showing her to the door at the time. And as she started to go out the door, she looked back at him and she said, well, I'm leaving, but I will be back. So it really struck Tom's heart. And he said, no, you're not leaving. Come back in. So that was the beginning of Sandra being with his way and learning more about the way that they did this. Um, another person that I would like to really bring up is uh, Jeff, um, Vicki, and... and um, Vicki and Barry Johnson. Yeah, son. Barry Johnson's yeah. son. He was at his way that same summer, and he graduated. But the damage that the alcohol mm -hmm. did to his body, he died in December mm -hmm. of 2016. So there's a need. These people need Jesus. They need him in a big way. Their hope, the hope that they have will be in Jesus. He's the only one that can do that. The prince of this world deceived them in telling them that he can do these things for them. And, it, it, and this is no economic issue either. I mean, there are people from, um, from the deepest poverty to the greatest wealth who are going to struggle with addictions right. as well. So right. this thing really didn't begin to take off until you guys really got serious about prayer though, right? Yes. And that was actually um, Todd White Sandra talked to Todd. El Todd White's one of our elders here. Right? Yeah, and uh, he had suggested that she form a group of prayer warriors, and we meet once a week. And we started that in March of this year. And uh, that's when it, like you said, it just took off. So you've got Barry Johnson, who's Jeff's father, on the board. Um, um, there is uh, Tina Greer, who used to be yeah. a member here a long time ago. Um, then the Hartzells, Lynn Hartzell, who moved to, they were members here, moved to Nashville. On the, you're on the board. Mm -hmm. um, and so Rolo, who runs Rolo's Restaurant, if you haven't been to Rolo's, they got a railroad track around <laughs> the inside. 
It's just the most, uh, take, your, uh, take your grandchildren. You'll, you'll love it. So, um, now there's a big event coming up, right? Uh, right. September 7th, mm -hmm. and somebody special is going to be there. Yes. It is a lot of, a lot of you people are Alabama fans. And so. Uh, but I'm we're gonna... open to anybody. <laughs> I'm a Georgia fan. I'm going to be there. So. And if you pick up one of the little brochures that we have, it will tell you about that, about that event that's going to happen on the 7th. They're also going to have a, an auction. They're going to have a lot of other things planned. Some other people will be speaking besides Saran. Sir Han Stacy's going to be there. He used to play yeah. for the Crimson Tide. So. So. And he's got a story of his own, and he's trying to use that story and the fact that people know who he is to, to help try to help this ministry. So, yes. And that's September 7th. Uh, it's going to be here at Twickenham. And we, you've sold about uh, how many? You well, about we half your tables? 20 something tables, a little over half. Now. Okay, so oh, that over half their tables have been sold. Got uh, less than uh, 20 to go. So, if you'd like to get a table, it's how much? 500 a table? Yeah, 500 a table. 500 a table, or $70 a seat. So, it's much more economically feasible just to buy the whole table. So, and we'd like to have a lot of our folks yeah, represented And we would there. love for Twickenham to be on the yeah. top of that donor list, helping with Maggie, that. thank you for this, and we are going to be praying. We want to pray right now for this ministry, for Sandra, and for all the women in Huntsville that are struggling with it. Let's, uh, let's stand together and have a prayer, then we'll sing a song, all right? Holy Father, we are thankful for your love for us, and we recognize that there is an enormous amount of struggle uh, in this community for both men and women. We, we continue to lift up his way and ask you to bless Tom Reynolds and that entire team as they work with men who struggle in addiction. And we pray for her voice, that uh, women in Huntsville who are uh, trapped in substance abuse can find uh, a Christ-centered ministry like this that will bless and help and deliver them in the power of Jesus. Uh, we pray for their children. We pray for their husbands. We pray for their parents who are all concerned about these women, and we pray for healing um, so that they can become, once again, the hearts of their families, the spiritual centers of their families. Bless Sandra and Maggie and the rest of their team as they work together, and we pray that it will be a great success to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Maggie. Let's praise the Lord one more time together.
So if you want to, you can go ahead and look at Matthew chapter 25 this morning, Matthew chapter 25. By the way, you'll notice in your bulletin uh, that the men's retreat's coming up September 22nd. Uh, you guys want to take a look at that? There's a sign-up table out here in the lobby, and we're staying close by this time. New facility, it's a great facility, and I uh, urge you to sign up for that, uh, September 22nd. Uh, I want to hear this passage here in Matthew 25 in just a second, and I'm going to tell you up front that it'll probably make you uncomfortable. It's one of those passages. Um, so let's think about a story first. I, I don't know if this story really happened, but it's true. So a little boy decided he wanted to meet God. And he knew it was going to be a long trip because you can't just snap your fingers and find God, right? So he packed his, his, his book bag, his backpack, with six cupcakes and four juice boxes. And he headed out the door. And he walked about three blocks and started getting tired. And he saw an old woman sitting on a park bench and he decided there was plenty of room at the end of the bench for him, so he sat down. And he opened up his backpack, and he, he took out a juice box and a cupcake. And he noticed that the old woman looked thirsty, so he offered her a juice box, which she eagerly accepted. And of course, he had to punch the straw in for her because those things are adult-proof, right? Right? And since it isn't polite to eat in front of somebody, he gave her a cupcake too. And she smiled when she took the cupcake, and that made the boy very happy. So there they sat, the old woman and the boy, looking for God, on a park bench, eating cupcakes, sipping juice boxes, and smiling. They sat there a good 45 minutes or so. And the more they sat, the more she smiled. She had a very sweet smile, which the boy liked very much, so he offered her another cupcake, which made her smile again. So he plunged the straw into another juice box. And for most of the morning, they just sat there in silence. The boy smiling at the woman, and the woman smiling at the boy. And pretty soon, he figured it was time to go home. And so he got up to leave. And when he walked a few steps, he stopped. And he turned around and he ran back and he threw his arms around her neck and he hugged her and she gave him the biggest smile yet. And when he got home, his mother took one look at him and said, what's up with you? You look different in a good way. What have you been up to? The boy said, I've been eating cupcakes with God. And before his mother could reply, he said, you know, she's got the most beautiful smile in the whole world. Meanwhile, an elderly woman, just as radiant with joy, returned to her home, and her son looked at her when she walked through the door, and he said, what's up with you? You look different in a good way. What have you been up to? And she said, I had cupcakes with God. You know, he's much younger than I thought he would be. <laughs> okay, so now we're ready to hear this passage. Matthew 25, I'll begin in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick. And you looked after me. I was in prison, and you, ca you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothes you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. 
And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Okay, so let's, can we just be honest here? There are parts of this passage that make you at least uncomfortable. I mean, some of us don't like the part about judgment. We like stories about little boys looking for God and old ladies that have sweet smiles and thinking that God has the sweetest smile in the whole world. We, we like all that. But we don't like to hear about sheep and goats and eternal punishment. So let's just be honest about that. But when it comes to the Bible, we don't, we don't get to take out an X-Acto knife and cut away the parts we don't like, like Thomas Jefferson did. Because there it is in verse 46, bright red letters, no less. Some people are going to go away to eternal punishment. There it is. Let's be real clear about something, though. It is not God's will for anybody to ever be eternally separated from him. The Apostle Peter said that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God does not want to lose anybody. He derives no pleasure from it. And in fact, God has gone to great pains to see that everybody has an opportunity to spend forever with him. But he is not going to force people to have a relationship with him if they do not Want that? Want one? Now I'm going to say something here. Uh, you and I'm going to give you total permission to disagree with me on this, okay? And I will tell you that I could be absolutely wrong about it. There's some things I'm, I don't, I'm not wrong about. I, it, it's, it is not wrong that there will be a place of eternal punishment. That's that is that's what Scripture teaches. There it is. The nature of that, Donna, here's the part where you may disagree with me, and you're totally welcome to, but this is my opinion, okay? Many capable Bible students, very capable Bible students don't agree with me on this, but we're going to be unified anyway. In my opinion, the, when the Bible talks about the, the, the crackling fires of hell and outer darkness and the lake of fire and the place where the worm dieth not... It, it is not giving us a literal picture of hell. It's not like Dante's Inferno, right? In, in heaven, gates of pearl, streets of gold, the, I, all of that, I believe, is metaphor. I think the Bible is simply trying to tell us in language we can grasp that heaven is wonderful beyond our wildest imaginations. Take the greatest thing you can think of, it's that. It's, the, it's awesome. It's, that's how incredibly awesome heaven will be. And then think of the absolute worst thing you can think of. And hell will be like that. I, th I think that's what Scripture is trying to do with us. To tell us that heaven is a place you absolutely want to be. Hell is a place or a state that you want to avoid at all costs. Hell is total is the total absence of God, of anything good. You do not want to go there. And God does not want you to go. But God is not going to force himself on anyone. In the end, it's not so much that God sends people to an eternal place or state of separation as much as it is God honors our choices. God ratifies our choices. Some of us don't like that 
that this passage talks about that. But that's, there it is. That's what it talks about. Then some of us are uncomfortable with this passage because it seems to promote the idea that, and a lot of us have worked really hard to get over this and are still working hard to get over this idea, but this passage seems to promote the idea that if you go to heaven, you somehow earned it. Look at verse 30, verses 34 and 35. Jesus says to the sheep people, the righteous people, come take your inheritance because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Uh, you, you get this, heaven, because you did that. And then the goat people do not get to go to heaven because they did not do certain things. I don't know about you, but kind of pops into my head that that sounds a lot like earning your way to heaven. Dallas Willard helped put this in perspective for me. Uh, he said, grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Where did we get the idea that being saved by God's grace means there's nothing for us to do? We didn't get that from the Bible. Paul said, Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, we read this passage last week, it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's workmanship created to do what? To do good works. Saved by grace, created to do good works. Those two concepts, grace and work, go hand in hand not head to head. Uh, Titus chapter 2, I think we read this one last week too, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people that teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives when? In this present age. Grace and work, grace and good living are not opposites. They are on the same side of the page. They go together. Grace brings salvation, but it requires godly living, like Paul said, in this present age, in the here and now. I think maybe some of our discomfort with this passage in Matthew would go away if we let it say what it really wants to say. When we read this teaching of Jesus and others like it and conclude that it's all about getting your ticket punched for the big trip to heaven, we're, we're, we're missing some things. Like, like getting saved, we're, 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 it's almost like we're saying getting saved is the spiritual equivalent of receiving a get out of hell free card. But, but the passage is about a lot more than the hereafter. It is about the hereafter, but it's about more than that. It's about the here. The, the passage isn't just concerned about getting ready to die. It's about getting ready to live. Brian McLaren makes a penetrating observation. I'll quibble with it in only one way. He said, instead of asking if you were to die tonight, do you know for certain you would spend eternity with God in heaven? Which is the Baptist question, right? That's the one, that's the one they're always asking. Great question. He said, we should be asking, if you live another 30 years, what kind of person will you become? Hmm. I'd, phrase, I, I'd be more comfortable if we phrased it this way. In addition to asking if you were to die tonight, where would you spend eternity? We should be asking if you live another 30 years. It's both. We have to do both. I mean, look at what these verses emphasize. The most repeated phrase in the text doesn't have anything to do with heaven or hell, reward or punishment or eternal destiny. They focus more on mundane realities like food, drink, clothing, welcome, care, attention to others. The thing that gets repeated over and over, the construction is, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was a stranger, I was naked, I was sick, I was in prison. That litany of need, uh, that litany of need is repeated four times in those verses. What is Jesus trying to emphasize if he says it four times? I tell you, a phrase that popped into my head when I, when I read this passage and studied it, um, and it's kind of haunted me in a good way. The phrase that's, it's the title of this message this morning, stranger things have happened. Now, I don't mean stranger things like in the sense that, oh, the eclipse tomorrow is going to be a really strange thing, and, but stranger things have happened. 
I mean, strangers, stranger in the sense of people I do not know. Stranger things have happened. Um, every morning when I wake up, I need to let those four words set the agenda for my day. Stranger things are ha- have happened. Jesus is out there, and he is waiting for me. Somewhere in my day, I am going to encounter Jesus in the guise of a stranger. He is waiting for me to show mercy, to show kindness, to show grace, to care. The stranger is going to give me Jesus is going to give me and you an opportunity to minister to him. I need to remember that ever since the resurrection, stranger things have happened. He is out there waiting for me. He's out there waiting for you. And one day, when the king comes in his glory and sits on his throne to judge the nations, he may say to you and to me, I was a disgruntled motorist who needed a break in traffic. I was a sullen store clerk who needed a kind word. I was an overworked restaurant server who needed an extra 5% and a smile. I was your black neighbor. I was your white coworker. I was the immigrant trying to fit in in a strange culture. I was the guy who voted for the other party. I was the divorced dad. I was the single mom. I was the weird kid nobody sat with at lunch. I was the confused elder in the nursing home. I was the spouse trying to get through to you. I was your mom. I was your dad. I was your kid. The possible disguises the stranger will wear are infinite and inviting. How will Jesus appear to you this week? If we will embrace these stranger things, it'll revolutionize our relationships. It'll change our city slowly, but it will change. It will look different in a good way. Everybody's talking about the eclipse. It's going to get dark tomorrow. You know, people, it's dark out there every single day. We've we got to shine. And the way you shine is to recognize that every person you meet might be Jesus. He is Jesus. Let's stand. Let's sing together. We are not afraid to follow where you lead, leaving what we know for what we cannot see. We are not afraid, for we are not alone, and so we'll go with you.
couple of things as we close this morning. Don't forget Wednesday night again, midweek spring and dessert starts at 6.15. We've had great crowds. Hope you'll come back on Wednesday and enjoy that time together. There's a wedding shower today from 1.30 to 3 in the Mercy Building, and that is for Philip Clark, who is Stephen Ann Clark's son, so please help support that today. Also, the Saving Way that we mentioned earlier has several thrift stores, and one of their trucks is parked in our north parking lot. So if you've got a bunch of stuff at home that you've been needing to get rid of, great time. You can just bring it down here, throw it in the back of that truck. It's open. Uh, this is the, through today is the last day that it'll be here. They're picking it up tomorrow. So if you've got anything, do that, and uh, they would appreciate that. As always, we're glad that you're here. Hope you have a great day tomorrow, wherever you are, whether it's here or somewhere closer to this big event. But be safe wherever that is. And uh, like Jody said, just shine out there tomorrow. Have a great day. Let's close in prayer. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts, and we thank you for all of our blessings. We thank you for the opportunity to be Matthew 25 people, and we ask you to be with the His Way ministry and the Her Voice ministry and all the people that are, that are associated with that. We thank you, Father, for families here, for for new marriages, the Clarks, and for new births, the Barneys. We're grateful, Father, for all that we have. We ask you to um, uh, be with this church, be with, be with each generation here as we, uh, as we share with each other. We recognize you, Father, as the creator of the sun and the moon and the stars. And as we experience the eclipse tomorrow, help us to uh, remember it's all because of your glory. It's all because of, of your omnipotence that you put the laws of physics in motion. And, and we're humble, Father, that, uh, that you know our names, you know our stories, you know our dreams. You've, you've been with us in, in our best days and in our worst moments. And, and we ask you for forgiveness. We ask you for, or we're, we're grateful for your, your son who died to make our salvation possible. We pray, Father, for this church as we journey together. We thank you for its leaders, the elders and the ministers and their wives, and we pray for discernment. Pray for each of us as we, um, as we walk with you. We pray especially for the sick this morning and the disrupted and, and people that are struggling in many different ways. And Father, we love our country and we, we recognize that um, there's a lot of internal conflict and we just pray for peace. We pray for um, peaceful people all over the world, and we take comfort, Father, in knowing that you reign above all the chaos and all the disruption and brokenness of this world. In Christ's name, amen.